So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, the first session um, to open the, the conference after the, the keynote about uh, feedback. So again, um, if you have feedback at the end of the session, feel free to leave the card in the, in the back or just come talk to me and tell me um, what I can do better or if you have any other questions, feel free to ask that. The talk here is going to be about Angular applications, more specifically about security in Angular applications. Um, there's a lot of um, things to talk about here. Um, I, I made a selection of topics that fits uh, very nicely within the, the program of the conference. So um, I'm going to refer to other talks that will happen later in these two days um, whenever there's uh, something that will be explained in more depth. Maybe before we start, who here does not know what an Angular application is or how it works? OK, nobody? That's, uh, that's good. Um, I don't have to do the, the really uh, in-depth introduction to Angular. I just want to explain uh, very briefly what's different with an Angular application that's running in the browser and why, why this is a paradigm shift that we've seen and how it impacts security. And then we're going to talk about these security topics uh, for the remainder of the talk. So essentially, very briefly, an Angular application, um, you have static HTML, uh, you have static JavaScript on the server, you load it in the browser. Um, essentially, you bootstrap the application. You have a template with data binding, and data will be fetched from an API and injected into that template. That's essentially, um, in a nutshell, what an Angular application is or how it works under the hood. Of course, there's a lot more technical stuff, which you don't need to know um, for this talk. So even if you're not too technical, don't worry. Um, things will, will be fine, and hopefully you'll walk away with uh, practical security advice for your Angular applications. Biggest difference here, you can see that the server no longer generates the pages. Um, the server simply gives data, and the pages are generated and uh, manipulated on the client side. And that's essentially um, one of the major uh, shifts in an Angular application. Before we start, a small word about me. Um, I'm Philippe Dreyck, I'm from Belgium. Uh, I did a PhD in web security, and since then, I've been running a training program. I'm still associated with the university, but we run a commercial entity that does security assessments uh, of Angular applications, of web applications. We run training programs, courses, uh, things like that. I'm also part of SecUpDev. SecUpDev is uh, a week-long course in Belgium. So if you like Belgian beer, this is the perfect excuse to come there uh, and have your boss pay for it. So that's, uh, that's a good part. Uh, it's a week-long course based on, uh, focused on security for developers. So um, it covers a broad range of topics. It's a two-track course um, with a lot of uh, things going on there. But enough about me. Let's talk about security. Let's talk about Angular. First topic I want to mention or uh, touch upon is cross-site scripting. There's going to be a lot more on cross-site scripting, a lot more in-depth talks, um, but there's just the basics that you need to know um, that essentially every Angular developer should know, so I'm going to be brief about this. Very small recap, if you have something like this um, and that happens, you're essentially in trouble. Um, that's a very uh, simple proof of concept of a cross-site scripting attack. Um, of course, scripts can be, uh, or cross-site scripting can be a lot more can be HTML injection nowadays, can be a CSS injection. This is just a very small example. A refresher course on cross-site scripting. Back to the PHP days, what happened there? You had a page, you had some PHP code there, and you uh, put out a variable into the page. What's going to happen if somebody, uh, if you take the variable from the URL, for example, if somebody gives you their name, you're going to build a page with the name. That's kind of the, the goal. Of course, uh, hopefully all of you know by now that if somebody gives you this, uh, then that's going to happen. And if somebody gives you this, you're going to load remote scripts into your page. This is the textbook definition of cross-site scripting. Uh, this is definitely a very big problem, in, still a problem in a lot of applications. But we're not here to talk about PHP. I have one more slide on that, I promise, then I'm done. Um, how do you defend against this? Well, you need to encode the data um, when you put it into the page. This is, uh, again, textbook uh, defenses against uh, cross-site scripting. What this is going to do is when you give it some harmful, harmful input, the server is actually going to encode the special characters so that the browser does not get confused about the difference between data and code. Because that's the essence of the problem uh, in traditional cross-site scripting. The server builds a page, the server knows what's going on, the server knows I'm going to put data here, then he packages the whole thing into an HTML page and gives that to the browser. And then the browser is starting to process that, and the browser has no idea what's going on. He sees a script tag inside a header, uh, an H1. It's like, is that supposed to be there? I don't know. I have no idea. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. So, of course, when the browser is in doubt, he's simply going to execute it. That's uh, what the browser does. Uh, does very well, actually. And that's when you have cross-site script. What is the main problem with these kind of things? Why is it so hard to defend against this? Because it's not limited to one output. It's everywhere. Your whole application is full with outputs, 
Um, they are in all kinds of different contexts, as you can see here. I'm not sure whether you can see the laser pointer, but as you can see in the first line here, um, this is uh, inside a script block. You can have it inside an HTML attribute. You can have it inside an HTML tag. And all of these contexts require a uh, different um, way of encoding characters. For example, a script tag, the open bracket is dangerous in a certain context, but doesn't mean anything in another context. And that is why cross-site scripting is so difficult. Like I said, I'm done with PHP. Let's move to Angular. Angular actually makes cross-site scripting a lot less painful. Why? Because now we have a template on the client side. And we fetch data from an API and we insert the API uh, into the template. So the problem that we had before, that the server generates a page, gives it to the browser, and all context information is lost, that problem is gone. Now, when you insert something like this on the client side, Angular will have to put it into the template itself. Angular knows what it's doing. It knows like, whoa, this should be data. This should never, ever be code. So what you're going to get is the thing on the right. You're going to see the script code. It's not going to be executed. It's going to be rendered. And this is Angular at work uh, protecting you against cross-site scripting. This is uh, essentially what a server, what you had to do manually on the server before. Uh, nowadays, there are frameworks that do that on the server as well. This is essentially, that job has shifted from server-side to client-side, one of the big impacts of building client-side uh, JavaScript applications the way we do today. Of course, if you want to show some HTML, um, it's going to be painful. This does not work. Um, we consider the blink tag to be non-harmful here, uh, and we actually want that to work. We want the browser to pick it up and do something, well, useful with it. Um, so this is a problem with, uh, with the automatic escaping, but um, you can use something called sanitization. So if you bind this to, uh, in Angular 2, for example, to an inner HTML uh, attribute, it's going to be put into the, into the DOM, but Angular is going to um, make sure that it works as it's supposed to. So this is going to, um, well, honestly, I haven't checked whether the blink tag is supported or not, but uh, let's assume that it is supported and it's going to be uh, allowed to be processed by the browser. It's not going to be escaped. By the way, in Angular 1, this works, uh, works as well with the ng bind HTML um, directive and um, the ng sanitize module. If you're injecting something dangerous here, um, let's say you have some, some data and you have a script tag in there, um, the data is going to be inserted, but the whole point of the sanitizer is that it will take out the dangerous parts and leave the rest of the uh, data untouched. So it's going to process the data, it's going to look for, oh, script tags, that's not something we want in our data, let's take it out and leave the rest untouched. This works for uh, all kinds of other things as well. If you have an on-error handler with an image attribute, the uh, image tag, the image tag will be there, the on-error handler will be removed. That's again the sanitizer at work. So again, Angular kind of has your back here, that's, that's a good thing. Um, the only thing you need to keep in mind, or one of the, the most important things is um, respect what Angular is doing and don't try to go against it. Um, essentially, your job is to get out of the way and let Angular do whatever it does best. So um, in Angular 2, this, all this happens automatically. You don't need to enable something. Uh, this just works out of the box. Um, so the only thing you need to make sure is that every output goes actually through Angular. Once you start calling low-level DOM APIs, once you start using jQuery directly, uh, Angular is no longer in the mix and uh, it cannot protect you against these kind of dangerous attacks. That's number one. Number two is there are some methods that actually allow you to um, bypass the sanitizer to actually mark something as implicitly trusted and output it directly into the DOM. Um, this is not the right way to do this if you have untrusted data there. This is meant to be used for static snippets uh, to allow them to be outputted directly, but not ever for uh, untrusted data. In Angular 1, these functions were called trust as HTML, which caused a bit of confusion uh, by the name and people were using it uh, for some security purposes. So they renamed these things in Angular 2 to bypass security trust as HTML. And the bypass security should be like the trigger when you write this in your code, should be like the trigger like, what am I doing? Maybe I should read up on what this really does, and maybe I should be aware of, uh, of the consequences when I start to do that. That brings me to the first takeaway. So, like I said, uh, a lot of other talks go into uh, more details on this, so I just wanted to um, give you the, the heads up of what it's all about and what you should know um, when you're dealing with Angular. Um, essentially, Angular does a pretty good job, so let it do its job. That's the main lesson uh, about cross-site scripting protection that I can give you when you're building Angular applications. Three uh, potentially dangerous things that you can do. Um, First of all, you should never ever generate templates on the server uh, using untrusted data. This is uh, a very complicated topic, which I'm pretty sure another talk is going to cover in a lot of detail, so uh, go there if you want to know more. And be aware that that's something uh, really dangerous. 
Also, don't use the low-level APIs, we covered that, and um, don't use the bypass security functions unless you know what you're doing, unless it's static data. Complementary, if you want more control, there's a security policy called content security policy. Uh, most of you have heard of it uh, by now, I suppose. Again, other talks cover this in more detail, so I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, if you are interested in locking down your context, in restricting behavior when uh, an attack should happen, then CSP is the right way to go. All right, I have three takeaways, by the way. So the first one is down. Uh, let's move on to um, something else. Another aspect of Angular applications that's a, a bit less technical in a sense that it's not code level security, but it's more on the architectural level. And it's about session management. And it's about questions like, should I use cookies or tokens? Or the question here, how do you do session management in an Angular application? Of course, people have helpful advice, like, yeah, you should use um, JOT tokens and uh, attach it to every request and put it in local storage. Um, I kind of don't necessarily disagree, but I think it's a lot more nuanced than uh, a lot of people seem, um, seem to represent it, and uh, that's why I wanted to go into detail here. The stuff I'm going to cover is, is based on what I've seen in Angular applications that a lot of people get wrong, a lot of common mistakes that are being made. So I, um, I kind of uh, built this uh, session management story on top of that to explain to you uh, what the choices are, uh, what the consequences are of your choices, and how you should approach this in your application. I'm not going to say whether something is good or bad. I'm going to give you the options, and it's up to you to decide uh, how to deal with that. Session management, kind of important. Uh, these are two versions of the OWASP top 10. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on uh, whether one is better than the other. Uh, that's probably for someone else to decide. Um, the reason I'm showing this is because session management is in there. The second thing is broken authentication and session management, showing that session management is kind of a hard problem to get right, even though it sounds very simple. Uh, you can, you're going to see there's a lot of stuff you need to get right uh, to, to make it work. And there's a second attack uh, called cross-site request forgery, which is something I will explain in a bit, um, and especially related to cookie-based session management. So, session management, to me, it's not about cookies versus tokens. There are three properties that impact um, the way your system works and the way, um, or the, the things you should take into account when you're building your application. These are the transport mechanism, locality of the session management, and the representation of the session data. I'm going to cover each of these in a, in a bit more detail, and then we're going to dive into a few concrete uh, scenarios. Transport mechanisms, how do you transfer the session data between client and server? And cookies are a very, very old example of this. Cookies are simply uh, a way to transport session information. They have some behavior associated with how the browser deals with that, but in essence, it's, it's a header-based mechanism, it's transport. The authorization header is often used in Angular applications nowadays. It's also a, a transport mechanism. Um, it's similar to cookies, but it has a lot of different properties, and it's going to impact the way your application works uh, under the hood. Second property is locality. Do you store session data on the client or on the server? We used to do this on the server. Uh, maybe a quick question. Who here uses client-side sessions? Nobody, really. Who here uses sessions at all? Only three people, so uh, you're, you're still waking up, I guess. Uh, that, that's okay. So, um, traditionally, uh, session data is stored on the server side, but with Angular applications, a lot of people are moving to client-side sessions. Uh, we need to have stateless APIs, so of course, session data is pushed to the client, and this has a serious impact on how your application works and what data you can trust. And there's a lot of mistakes being made there, uh, which is, again, why I wanted to uh, cover part of that here today. And thirdly, we have the, the, the representation. And that's essentially, um, what, what is the format? This can be a custom format, sure. Um, this can be uh, a session identifier, like we're used to, but this can also be something like a JOT token or uh, whatever. Uh, I'm going to go into more detail there. By the way, I see people taking pictures. Uh, that's perfectly fine if you're taking pictures of me, of course. Uh, but the, the slides are also online. So on my uh, Twitter account, you can find the slides or a link to the slides. Um, so if that's easier for you, go ahead. If you want to take pictures, sure. Be my guest as well. So let's talk about a few of these properties. Let's talk about cookies first. Cookies have been around for ages. Um, you probably know cookies very well. You use cookies, but um, in my opinion, cookies are a bit messy, um, but they keep evolving, and there's uh, a few new things you need to know about cookies that you probably are not are really aware of. So very brief recap. Cookies are not very, inc very compatible with the same origin policy. So they're associated with the domain, they can be used on HTTP or HTTPS, which causes a lot of problems. They can be accessed from JavaScript, 
And essentially, that has led to the mess that we know today as cookies. So cookies need to have flags today, the secure flag, the HTTP-only flag. You know about this, hopefully. Um, if you don't, uh, you should go back a few editions and watch the videos. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you're going to learn from that. But essentially, this is, uh, to me, considered uh, common knowledge. However, there's a, a discrepancy with, with this system. So if you look at the header um, on, on the bottom here, the set cookie header contains all of this information, but when the server gets the cookie back, there's no information attached. He doesn't know whether it was a secure cookie or not. He doesn't know where the cookie came from. He doesn't know whether this was an attack um, that resulted from a cookie jar overflow or something like that. So essentially, there's, there's kind of a, a mismatch, and that still uh, leaves a lot of uh, attack surface uh, left. And that's why they, um, well, the, the smart people uh, building the, the web platform uh, came up with a, a new specification called cookie prefixes. And cookie prefixes take it a step further and they essentially add a prefix to the name of the cookie which ensures that certain security properties will be guaranteed by the browser. So essentially one of these prefixes is the, the secure prefix, well the underscore underscore secure dash prefix. So you can uh, name your cookie underscore underscore secure dash uh, session identifier or whatever, SID, PHP session ID, uh, doesn't matter. Um, whenever that prefix is present in the name, the browser, uh, a supporting browser, will start enforcing strict rules. So in this case, if this cookie is set over an insecure connection, the browser will refuse it, meaning that it needs to be set over a valid HTTPS connection. Essentially, um, if you go into the security properties there, this means that this has to come from your server or someone with a lot of power uh, impersonating you. And of course, the secure flag needs to be present if you want to use that prefix. If these conditions are not met, the browser will not set the cookie, will not remember the cookie, and um, a potential attack will be um, evaded. Second thing, uh, second prefix that's available is a host prefix. Uh, essentially, the host prefix uh, subsumes the secure prefix, so it enforces everything uh, from the secure prefix, but it also uh, makes sure that the cookie belongs to a specific host and can never be sent to an entire domain. So essentially, um, what you get here, if the server receives a cookie with the underscore underscore host dash prefix in the name, and the browser supports this, by the way, all modern browsers do, uh, nowadays, then the server knows that this cookie um, did not come from a subdomain, that the cookie was not set by an attacker who controls one of your subdomains, for example. And this gives the, the server additional information because now the server knows that the cookie was handled uh, securely and get, uh, can get some assurances that an attack did not happen on the client side. This is fairly new. Um, support is, is, uh, is uh, well, widespread, so that's definitely a good thing. So this is something that you can start using today if you want to. Um, if there are people here building frameworks, please consider supporting this in a framework. Uh, in, in most frameworks, this is really difficult to configure, um, which makes it uh, a bit more tricky to start supporting this uh, in a lot of applications. Of course, when we talk about cookies, um, there's one thread that's really important. It has its own uh, little category in the OWASP top 10, which is called cross-site request forgery, or CSERF. Uh, CSERF is essentially um, a very sneaky attack happening in the browser. Um, that is often underestimated because the effects are not really visible. So let me walk you through a scenario of how a C-Server attack actually happens, uh, and then I'm going to, uh, hopefully, you're going to grasp what it's all about, and I'm going to tell you how you can protect against C-Server attacks. So in a C-Server attack, um, you have a legitimate site. Let's say the site on the right, website.be, is uh, legitimate, and we log, there, we log in to the website as a normal user. So you log in, you get a page um, with a cookie, doesn't really matter what's in the cookie, uh, whether it's server-side or client-side, um, we don't care about that here. The cookie is, of course, stored in the browser uh, for future use, so if you make another request, the browser will attach that cookie to your request, the server will look up your session, know, okay, this was Philip, um, let me show him his messages or whatever, um, and that's what's happening there. If you go to uh, another website, uh, apparently not containing cat pictures anymore, but tiger pictures, um, I was paying attention during the keynote, um, you get a page with some pictures, uh, whatever. Of course, the page in the background can launch a request to the website.be uh, backend. It can uh, load a hidden form, load an image, whatever. So it can ask the backend to post a message. The problem, this is where the CSERF uh, really comes down to, the problem is the browser sees that request going out and attaches the cookie to that request. So essentially, at this point, the browser is like, ooh, a request to website.be, I have a cookie for that. If the backend is not aware that this request comes from somewhere else and not its own application, it's going to process this uh, as any normal request. And that's the essence of a CSERF attack. So it's an unintentional request abusing the credentials of the user from within its own browser. Uh, so you, I can launch this from any website, uh, so the backend essentially needs to be aware that requests can come from anywhere, and then you can protect uh, 
well, can differentiate between the intentional and the unintentional requests. This is CSERF. Essentially, the reason for CSERF is the liberal hand handling of cookies in the browser. Because the browser simply attaches cookies to any request, um, we have to deal with things like CSERF. By default, there's no way to indicate whether something is intentional or not. Um, and that's one of the problems. The common, um, sorry, uh, the, the problem is uh, that the backend needs to be uh, really aware of CSERF before you can take action. If you don't know about CSERF, you will not have implemented the defense against CSERF, and you will probably be vulnerable to this. So that's uh, definitely one of the problems. It's in the OWASP top 10, but major companies, Google, Facebook, eBay, they all suffered from CSERF at uh, one point or another. There's even um, a kind of uh, CSERF attack that's even more dangerous. Um, people have discovered uh, that home routers are uh, apparently not very secure. Um, so if you have a home router with a web interface, it's probably vulnerable to CSERF. Meaning that somebody, if you visit a web page, can start launching requests at your router uh, to change, for example, DNS settings. So they can change DNS settings on your router from just within any context using CSERF. That's kind of dangerous, which they did in uh, South America, by the way. They had a huge campaign where they uh, changed more than 300,000 devices uh, settings so they could reroute DNS traffic and they could serve, you, uh, serve the users fake pages whenever they wanted to. So this is definitely uh, a real threat that you need, need to take uh, into account. So how do you defend against CSERF? The common defense, we, we've known about CSERF for a long time, by the way. This is not new. Uh, we've known how to protect CSERF against CSERF as well. And the common defense is essentially hiding a, a little token into the form, a hidden form field. Um, you give it to the, to the browser when you request the page, and you check when the, the things come, thing comes back whether um, the token is still there, and then you know it's a legitimate submission. This is by, uh, this leverage the same origin policy to hide a token from other contexts. Um, but of course, this depends on server-side page generation. You need to insert um, tokens into, into the page uh, when you generate it, and you need to uh, check them again when you get it back. You can imagine this doesn't work well with, with Angular applications. You don't have server-side pages anymore. You have templates, and that's it. Um, so Angular applications support a different mechanism, uh, and that mechanism is called transparent tokens. There, there are other names for it as well, like double cookies or whatever. Um, I'm going to explain what it is, and then the name doesn't matter anymore. You're going to recognize it when you see it, uh, regardless of the name. So what is a transparent token defense? Essentially, uh, we have the same scenario as before, but instead of simply giving us uh, a session cookie, we also get a second cookie, which again is stored in the browser as before. Whenever a request is made, the browser is going to make sure that the second cookie is also there. This is standard browser behavior. That's how it works. You also notice this thing here. This thing is actually a token. Um, that the browser has copied from the cookie to the header. So this is what's going to happen here. You have the two cookies. Uh, one is a session identifier, the other one is a CSERF token. And the browser uh, application, the client-side application, Angular in our case, is going to copy this cookie value to this header, custom header. Note that another context will not be able to do this. So if we have our uh, cat picture context, it's, it can make the request, the cookies will be there, but um, according to all the rules of the, of the web and within the browser, this context will never be able to read cookies from the other context. So it will not be able to read the CSERF token cookie. It will not be able to copy that value to the header. So whenever you send that to the server, the server can simply look, oh, the header is not there, or maybe it's there, but the value is not the same. So I'm going to refuse that request from happening. Of course, this means that uh, your CSERF token should at least be unique per user. Uh, that's the, the minimum requirement there. So. I said Angular uh, supports this. How, how does that work? Well, it works by default. So if you have Angular 1, this is enabled by default. It looks for the cookie. If the cookie is present, it simply copies it to the header on outgoing, outgoing requests, and that's it. That's uh, kind of nice. And Angular 2 is just the same. Enabled by default, you can configure it. If you use uh, other cookie names, you can modify the configuration. But by default, this behavior is enabled. And the really good thing here is that um, this means you don't need to uh, do anything on the client. Of course, you need to enable this on your backend. If you still haven't heard of CSERF, Angular is not going to protect you because the cookie is not going to be there. But once you have set this cookie, which is uh, very straightforward um, in, in just about any backend, um, you can easily enable this kind of uh, behavior. There's a second potential defense um, that you can use, and that's called same side cookies. And this is, again, something new. This is a new cookie attribute um, that's been there for half a year, maybe a year. Um, and essentially what it comes down to is you set a cookie, um, like before, 
and the cookie will be present on requests like before. The only difference is when you set the cookie, you add the same site flag. And same site uh, essentially tells the browser, this cookie is supposed to be used for my site only and not when you come from somewhere else. So if you have something like this, the request is made, but the cookie will not be attached by the browser because the browser knows the cookie, but it's same site. So the browser is like, okay, you're coming from any site.io, going to website.be, that's not the same site, so I'm not gonna attach this cookie uh, for you. And that's same site cookies, and that's pretty awesome. You see that there's a strict mode um, enabled here, the value of the attribute. There are essentially two modes, strict and lax. Uh, strict means it will never be there on cross-origin requests, uh, cross-domain requests, sorry. Uh, lax means it will only be there on safe top-level navigation. So if it's a get request that triggers a navigation, like if you go from Google search results to the web page, then the cookies uh, will be there in lax mode, um, otherwise they will be absent. Note, very important uh, difference, this only works on registered domains, not origins. So this will not protect your uh, C-surf between subdomains, this only works on website.be, for example. So um, if the cookie is marked same site for website.be, if you come from any other domain, it will not be uh, attached on the request. Sounds pretty cool. Um, the default setting is strict mode, by the way. This stops all C-server attacks. Um, in my opinion, this is what cookies should have done from day one. Um, but uh, as you know on the web, it's, uh, it's easy to say that in hindsight. Um, but also, if you use lex mode, this will stop uh, almost every C-server attack uh, that's out there. Only problem with this, um, very cool to use. Um, but nobody supports it except Chrome and uh, Opera. So that's the downside. Um, this will probably pick up in the future. Um, I'm not sure when. Uh, maybe there's some people from browser vendors here. You can ask them. Um, but this doesn't need to stop you from using it. If the browser doesn't know the attribute, it will simply ignore it. So you can start deploying this today to um, prevent uh, abuse with cookies from, uh, from uh, in Chrome and Opera. And you can um, benefit from that in other browsers later on. So, I've been talking a lot about cookies. Um, some of you may not use cookies anymore because it's Angular and whatever cookies we use the authorization header. Sure, that's a viable alternative. Some of you are old enough to remember the authorization header for something like this. Uh, when you got this pop-up to enter a username and a password and the authorization header was actually used to transmit that username and password on every request. Um, that's not what I'm talking about here. If you still use that, uh, there's probably better ways uh, of doing that. What I'm talking about is using the authorization header to transmit session information. Transmit uh, session object, a token, uh, doesn't really matter. The reason this became popular again, uh, it's used a lot in, in uh, OAuth flows. If you have an OAuth flow with an access token, you need to send that to the server. Uh, this is probably the way you're gonna do that. Um, the reason to use the authorization header, one of the reasons is it's well known um, it's been around for 25 or 30 years, so a lot of uh, software proxies uh, on the internet will recognize it and will not remove it. Some of them uh, remove features if they um, don't know it. Uh, with the authorization header, this is not gonna be the case. The big problem with this is the browser does not handle the authorization header automatically. Meaning if you're building an Angular application and you want to use this, you will have to attach your tokens from JavaScript on every outgoing request yourself. That's um, one thing. The second thing is you'll need to store this information yourself. With cookies, the browser did everything for you. Everything handled automatically with the authorization header. No such thing. You'll need to do everything yourself and you need to do it manually. Of course, this is well supported by frameworks and libraries and Angular has some support for that as well. Um, so if you want to do this in an Angular application, I got this from a blog post uh, about Angular 1, you can, for example, store it in local storage and then uh, write an HTTP interceptor that easily uh, intercepts our outgoing request and attaches the authorization header there. So that's essentially the line here. Uh, you add an authorization header and you call it bear bearer and you add the token from local storage right there. Easy enough, right? Can you see a problem doing this? There are actually two, prob two, pro two problems. Who can spot one? No? The first, this kind of assumes that you only contact your own API. So this attaches a token to every outgoing request. And this is uh, fine when you start developing because you get your data from the API. The second you start using a third party API, just for some small features, it's gonna send XHR requests. You're gonna attach your token to that outgoing request. So you're gonna leak your token, your user's token essentially, to all third party APIs that you contact. That's definitely 
one of the things that uh, is often overlooked because it's so easy to implement. And the second problem, it's not obvious from this code, this only works for XHR requests. So what happens if you have a request in, uh, that comes from an element in the DOM? What happens if you insert an image tag with an SRC? It's going to trigger a request, the browser is going to fetch that image, but there's not going to be an authorization header present. So if you require access control on that uh, image load, the server has no information to make that decision on, or to base that decision on. And this is something that actually uh, starts appearing in a lot of applications, and people have to revert to some, something like a, a mixed authorization header and cookie-based system to deal with these kind of things. So this is not an easy problem to solve, but this is something you need to be aware of when you make this decision. And there's a few of, of these trade-offs that, that you need to be aware of when you do this, uh, do this in your applications. And I've uh, made, made a very brief overview of uh, two of these aspects. First of all, storing session data in a browser. There are a couple of options if you do this in your Angular application. Um, one is in-memory. Uh, in-memory is uh, easy to do. It's available to your running code. That's sure. That's, that's very good. But this does not survive a page reload. So, of course, when somebody reloads the page, um, your memory or context is uh, reinitiated and your token is gone. The benefit of doing this is um, if there is some kind of an injection attack in your page, um, using in-memory storage can kind of shield the token from, uh, from that script. So it's uh, really difficult to steal that or you can make it really difficult to steal uh, your session token uh, in, in case of an attack. The other ones is a bit, uh, bit different. Session storage. Session storage is, um, you, you have this web storage API with local storage and session storage. Session storage is lesser known. Um, it's actually uh, context related, so it's tab related. So if you have a session store in a window, um, it's available to all code from that origin in that window. Um, and if you open a new window from within that window, it shares the same session storage. But if you open an entirely new browser window and navigate to the same web page, it's gonna get a fresh session store. So if you store it there, it survives page reloads. Uh, that's a good thing. It's not shared across Windows, so that's, uh, that might be a disadvantage. It depends on the application. Um, and of course, when you have an injection attack, it needs to happen in the tab where the, session, uh, where the token actually lives in session storage. Then local storage is the easiest to use, the most common, uh, commonly used as well. It's available to the entire origin. So every page in that origin has access to the same local storage. Awesome, survives page reloads, uh, easily shareable, true. But if you have an injection attack somewhere, um, it's very easy to steal that token from local storage. This is one of the common injection vectors uh, for cross-site scripting. It used to be stealing your cookies. Um, now it's also stealing all the data in your local storage. Of course, a very important side note, people often uh, talk about, yeah, but y you can uh, hide something in cookies with HTTP only, but not in local storage. Keep in mind that you still have a cross-site scripting attack vector. So if somebody is stealing your local storage through there, you already have a major problem. Uh, so you're only stopping one of the generic attack vectors if you try to uh, avoid this from happening, but you still have cross-site scripting uh, hole in your application that can be abused for all kinds of bad. So these are decisions you'll need to make, and there's more. If you talk about cookies and the authorization header, which is the right question to ask, there's a lot more to consider. Cookies, well, they both can contain any kind of data, so that's good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in the, in the next part. Um, so that's one thing they have in common. Cookies are associated with the domain. The authorization header, you attach that yourself. You can send it anywhere. If you share domains on your application, like Google, Google has google.com, youtube.com, uh, blogger.com, whatever. Um, for cookies, they have to share the cookie explicitly across all of these domains. With the authorization header, they would be able to send it wherever they want. They can check, oh yeah, this is one of ours. We can use the same, same token here. Cookies are handled automatically, attached automatically, which is really easy uh, to use. The authorization header is uh, done manually, so it's not going to be present on browser-generated requests, requests coming from the DOM. Of course, the automatic behavior shows that CSERF is a problem with cookies. It's not a problem with the authorization header. If you manage to do that, you uh, probably need some help um, building applications because really you're doing it uh, really wrong. Uh, this, this is not uh, going to be an issue with the authorization header. And then finally, um, some people argue, like I said before, you can hide cookies from malicious JavaScript, which is uh, kind of a patch to, to a serious vulnerability. Um, or a kind of a, a band-aid through a serious vulnerability, it's uh, a bit different with the authorization header. So these are things to keep in mind. Bring me to the second takeaway. Choosing how you transport your session data has a really big impact on your application. And this is something that doesn't appear to be, ap isn't apparent in, in many Angular tutorials. It's like, yeah, just use Jot with local storage and you're fine. Well, 
honestly, it's a bit more complicated than that. And we covered that in, in the past, uh, past few slides. Cookies, in my opinion, um, a lot of people know how they work. Um, we have experience with cookies, so it's not a bad thing to stick with cookies. Um, actually, a lot of web stuff depends on cookies. You have course, cross-origin resource sharing. It works very well with cookies. It doesn't work very well with the authorization header. Um, we can go into more detail on that afterwards if you have more specific questions on, about that. Uh, but it's just one example. Of course, cookies means you need to deal with CSERF. Um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. With Angular, it seems to be uh, kind of mandatory to use these client-side sessions with job tokens uh, and the authorization header because that's one way to do it, and that's what a lot of people actually advise you to do it. Um, like I said, this is not very compatible with some of the other web technologies, so that's definitely something to take in mind. However, um, since a lot of people are actually using that, and a lot of people are um, making some mistakes using uh, job tokens, that's uh, going to be the topic for the last part of this presentation which I should be able to finish just in time. Who here uses job tokens? Okay. People are waking up, that's good. Um, just in time for the final takeaway message in, in five minutes. So job tokens. Um, officially, they're uh, an open industry standard for representing claims securely between uh, different parties. Essentially, what it comes down to is uh, a job token looks like this. Um, it's three different parts. If you split it up, you have a header, a payload, and a signature. In essence, it's JSON, so it's easy to process with JavaScript. Great. Um, and it has some kind of a signature. There's, again, another talk going into a lot more details on JOT. Uh, so if you want to know more, definitely go, uh, go there. The important part is the payload. The payload has all the information you want to store. There are some reserved fields there, like who issued this issued it when it expires, but you can also add custom fields there. You probably know this if you use it. The cool part is a signature. The signature is generated on a header and a payload using the algorithm specified here. So it's uh, an HMAC uh, with SHA-256, and the signature is got generated on a header, the payload, using a server-side secret. And essentially what this allows you to do, this allows you to verify the integrity of a token when you get it back, because it's been stored on the client. You need to make sure that when you get it back, it's a valid token, that nobody is tampered with it one of the impacts of moving things towards the client. So, um, like the spec says, it's a way to represent claims um, securely. Securely means, in this case, at least ensuring integrity. There's uh, an additional spec that supports encryption as well. Um, again, more details about that in other talks. Um, your backend should be responsible for generating these tokens, obviously, but also for uh, ensuring that the token is valid, uh, ensuring the, the integrity of a token before handling this. This is what actually uh, goes wrong in a lot of applications. So um, people forget to verify the signature before they use it. They simply decode it uh, and get the data out because it's simply, oh, I forgot to mention, it's base64 encoded, so it's not, uh, not uh, hard to get the info out of. And they actually get, uh, get that wrong. That's one of the common mistakes. Also, a lot of client applications depend on the information present in the JOT token. So they start decoding this uh, JOT token on the client and uh, extracting information out of that. Uh, I don't really recommend that because this makes your application dependent on the format of the token that the server actually uses. So if you need this information, just send it in a separate channel, send it as a JSON response, uh, whatever. Um, so it's a lot cleaner to do it that way. Like we covered before, the Angular application will need to make sure that the JOT token is there if you use it. We uh, covered the transport mechanism in a lot of detail, so um, you definitely know how to do that now uh, as well. JOT tokens, uh, originally used in OpenID Connect, well, uh, probably before that as well, but uh, this is where they became um, popular, and uh, nowadays they're actually uh, a very standardized way. There's a lot of libraries out there that uh, offer support for this. Two important things, um, or one important thing I want to cover uh, to conclude uh, this stuff on JOT. There's two ways to generate a signature, and this is what, uh, again, a lot of people get wrong. There's a way to do this with a shared key within your application, and a way to do this uh, with a public-private key pair to share across applications. Let me show you. By the way, there are other specs covering uh, all the details of these JOT tokens. Let me show you. Within one application, if you have this scenario, the server can generate a JOT token, send it to the browser, gets it back, and can verify the integrity. You see that he uses the same key for both. This is a shared key. This is really important to grasp. Why? Because if you want to share this token with a third party, and you want them to be able to verify the integrity, you would have to share your server-side secret, which is a very bad idea. Because the property is, if you know this, 
Uh, this key you can generate fellow tokens, uh, not only verify, but also generate. And that's uh, one of the major problems. And I've actually um, seen this in applications being used in the wrong way. So what you should you do in this case, um, which is also the case uh, of how OpenID Connect uh, does this, for example, if, for example, Google generates a JOT token with your identity information, it's going to use a uh, private key to generate a signature, and anybody with a pub public key can verify that signature. And that's essentially the right way to uh, share JOT tokens across applications or even within one application where you have different services. You definitely want to uh, not share your secret to all of these services, but you want to start moving towards this uh, a bit more complex system, but also uh, a lot more uh, secure in a sense than sharing your shared key. Uh, very important and something that uh, not a lot of people know actually because most people talk about the shared key mechanism, the HMAC, but not about uh, these public-private public, uh, public -private key signatures. Um, a final word on JOT tokens. They are very young. Um, they've been around for a couple of years. They have some growing pains. So essentially, one of the big problems is that they use crypto, and crypto is really hard. Um, we've seen this in the past with XML, and we are seeing this again with JOT tokens. So there's a talk. Um, I think later today about uh, some problems with, uh, with the crypto behind JOT tokens as well. One big problem is that the header contains the algorithm that's being used for the signature generation or the encryption, but that the header cannot be trusted until the signature has been verified. Yet you need the information that's in there to verify the signature, and that causes some problems. So a few examples of the past, uh, past year uh, or two. Um, essentially, one of the problems is the libraries accepted the non-algorithm, so somebody can simply say, uh, don't verify the signature at all and give you an arbitrary token that would be accepted. Uh, and there are a few others as well. The links are uh, at the bottom of the slide, so you can look it up uh, yourself. Brings me to the third takeaway. Um, Jots are well supported, uh, often recommended, uh, but if you use them, I don't advise against using them, but uh, they require constant supervision. They're like small children, you need to keep your eye on them, uh, you need to make sure that um, when something happens, you can essentially uh, update your libraries and make sure that uh, you are not vulnerable to these uh, kind of attacks. Be aware of these signatures, uh, signature mechanisms and the important difference of, uh, between them. Uh, otherwise, you're probably going to get it wrong and uh, you're going to be very vulnerable to, uh, to fake tokens, uh, to uh, forged tokens. Um, and of course, um, keep, keep everything up to date to avoid uh, being uh, vulnerable to these kind of mistakes. There's a lot of libraries supporting JOTs. They're updated very frequently, uh, normally. So uh, definitely make sure you keep uh, an eye on that and stay on track there. Brings me to the conclusion, uh, three takeaways. So if you've been asleep, this is where you wake up and start paying attention. Uh, first, JOTs, uh, we covered that. Uh, well supported, um, recommended to use, but make sure you know what you're getting into. They don't necessarily make things easier, they just make things different. Session data, um, how you transport this has a very big impact. Uh, this means whether you need to worry about CSERF or not. This means whether you'll be able to uh, protect DOM-based uh, resources being loaded, or you have access control checks on them or not. Uh, these things matter, even though on the surface they seem like, yeah, it's, it's about the same, whatever, we'll use this, no more cookies. Under the hood, this changes a lot of things. And then finally, if you're using Angular, um, be happy that Angular does cross-site scripting protection quite well. There are some uh, bypasses, as other people will uh, cover here at the conference uh, as well. Uh, but in general, don't do stupid things and you get, uh, get uh, this protection uh, kind of for free from Angular. All right, so um, I actually give trainings and, uh, and, and I talk about security. I don't build uh, secure, well, I build small applications that I use. Uh, not a lot of other people use it, except my wife, but that doesn't really count. So you guys build the applications that we use. So you guys need to build secure applications. So that's part of my go away, takeaway message. Please uh, take this into account when you build applications. Follow people that know about this. Follow the people that um, speak about security. There's plenty of speakers here at the conference. They, they write blog posts, they, they're on Twitter. Follow them so you're sure you're up to date. So you know when uh, vulnerability in JOT occurs and you can easily patch your systems. And finally, share. This is the most important thing. This was mentioned during the keynote as well. Share your experience. If you're doing something security-wise, talk about it. There's plenty of local meetups. Uh, they're always looking for speakers. Go there and tell the other people, this is how we did security at whatever company you work at. Because this will inspire others to do the same. And this will uh, spark discussion. And this will essentially raise awareness and uh, hopefully help us achieve a better and a more secure web. That's it for me. 
you can, um, Okay, it's not on my screen, but my contact information is on the big screen. So you can uh, get a hold of me there. If you have any questions, I'll be here um, the whole conference. Uh, so feel free to grab me, uh, except when I'm going to the bathroom, but otherwise uh, that's fine. And you can, we have some time for questions now, I think, yep. a few minutes. If you want to stand in the spotlight, feel free to do so. Thank you. I don't blame you, so it's okay. <laughs> so just a question about cross-site request forgery. What about login cross-site request forgeries and similar other kinds that happened before the user authenticates? Can Angular protect against those? Um, yes, so login CSERF is, uh, is a very uh, specific kind of attack where instead of forging a request uh, using the user's credentials, you're essentially um, faking, uh, sending a request to the login endpoint using the attacker's username and password, for example. So the goal is to log the user in as the attacker, which seems weird, but if your application stores data on what the user does, then this, the data is actually stored with the attacker. That's just one example, there are a few others. Um, the protection mechanism is the same, yes. So if you have the, the token present, and transparent token defense works very well um, in, in that scenario as well. So the backend should again check when the user logs in, do I, do I have this, this cookie set and do I have the same cookie value in the header? Then I'm sure that this can only come from my own Angular application, this call. Otherwise, it can come from anywhere and I should probably ignore it. And the same holds for the logout endpoint. This is something that a lot of people overlook with CSERF, so you can easily log out uh, users by simply making a GET request to the logout endpoint uh, because that's often unprotected as well. That's some free advice there. <laughs> Anybody else? Let's make a run a bit. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, just a question, it's a, a bit remark. Uh, so I think JVTs cannot be used for sessions because uh, you can't invalidate them uh, or just can be used with very low uh, expiry time. And I think it should be mentioned in uh, these kind of uh, presentations or in Angular applications. Yeah, if you, well, you're, you're opening a can of worms there. Uh, uh, yes. yes, one of the, one of the, the, the comments on, on uh, jobs is that you can't revoke them. Yes, you can't revoke them. Um, are you saying you can or you cannot? Uh, no, you cannot, uh, well, or very, very hardly. Th can. Th there, are, there are ways to do this, yes. This is, this is a common uh, discussion. It's not limited to job tokens. It's ah. all client-side uh, session data, essentially. If you use your own custom data in a cookie, you have the same problem. So one of the issues there is it's hard. With server-side sessions, revoking a session if something goes wrong is as simple as deleting the server-side session object and it's gone. So whenever the user comes back with that session, the server is going, I don't know who you are, please log in again. With job tokens, this is a lot more difficult because the thing lives on the client. And if you want to revoke this, I don't know, first of all, I don't know how many tokens I've given out. Um, so whenever a token comes back, I don't know whether it's still valid or not. So one of the ways that uh, people recommend doing this is this like a heated debate between the, the pro client-side sessions and the, the anti-client-side sessions uh, team. One of the ways is to keep a list of all the identifiers of the jobs that you've given out and keep a blacklist as well. And then you can uh, start blacklisting tokens. Of course, the whole client-side session thing fits in the, in, the, in the stateless API architecture. But of course, if you have a blacklist, you don't have a stateless API anymore because on every request, you need to check your blacklist. Is this still valid? Oh yes, okay, it is. And then you can... Uh, perform the request. So you start introducing uh, some state there again. So yes, that is indeed one of the, the common problems. But there are ways to address that, but um, they're not pretty. Yeah, th thanks for the remark. Um, I, I only had 45 minutes, so <laughs> I had to, to cut a bit in what I went into. Anybody else? Okay, then thank you very much. Please don't forget uh, the feedback. If you like the presentation, leave a thank blue you. card. If you have anything else, I'm still here, so feel free to come up and we can talk about that. Enjoy the conference.